questions. <laughs> Okay, entonces buenas noches a todos. Welcome everyone to our closing event of Trinity University Latinx Heritage Month. Thank you all for uh, being with us tonight. My name is Dani Abreu Torres and I am the Mexico, the Americas and Spain program director. Before we start uh, our event, I want to thank you all for just being part of all the events during this very exceptional month, especially that is virtual. So thank you all for not zooming out and still coming in. I also want to thank the Alvarez family uh, for their constant support to our program and Trinity's initiatives. And a deep thank you to our colleagues from the Global Latinx Studies, International Studies, and Student Life for their financial support. Uh, we always count on you, so thank you very much. A quick announcement, the MAS program is currently working on the Alvarez Seminar for the 2021 uh, spring. So uh, like us on our Facebook page, I will post the link in a minute so you can receive more information about that. So sin MAS, and finally, some Zoom housekeeping. Remember to keep your microphone on mute and activate your speaker view while our guests are uh, in speak speakers are sharing their experiences. You can post any questions to the chat and we will uh, forward them to our moderator. And when the time comes, you will be able to open your mic uh, and ask your questions. So thank you again. And it is my pleasure to present our moderator for tonight, Dr. Norma Cantu. Enjoy and do not forget to vote. Muchas gracias, Anya. Thank you very much. Uh, buenas tardes, everyone. Primero que nada, I want to acknowledge that here in San Antonio, we are in the land of the Papayan, a group from the Coahuiltecan tribe. And uh, I want to honor that. We're in Yanaguana, el nombre indígena de San Antonio. And uh, I want to introduce our two speakers today just very briefly. Rosie Castro and Antonia Castañeda. Rosie and Antonia are both friends that I've known for a long time, both very active in the Chicano movement at the time. So we were planning the events for the Latinx Heritage Month. Our committee decided that uh, we wanted to close the month long lecture series, if you will, with them so that they could give us at the end, go back to the history, but also go forward. And so I'm just gonna go right in and ask each one of them to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about growing up Chicana and um, the differences, because one of the things we wanted to highlight was that the commonalities and the differences of experience. So Rosie, por favor. Sure, thank you very much for that introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I guess I'll start with telling you a little bit about my mother who came over as an orphan uh, in about 1920, along with her sister. My mother was about six years old. My, her sister was about three or four. And uh, they had been orphaned in Mexico. And their grandmother, try, or their grandmother, yeah, tried to, you know, bring them up, but she could not afford to. So they kind of got sent here and there. Finally, it was decided that they would be sent here to San Antonio with some relatives. So she came um, and lived with a family and was right away split up from her sister. Her sister Trinidad went to live with another family and my mother Victoria lived with the Garcia family. Um, shortly after the, the Garcia family the lady that had raised my mother for several years then died as well. So my mother's early years were uh, very traumatic in that there was a lot of loss. And then to boot it off, when she started school, she was pulled out of school in the third grade. So that many of the dreams that she had later, um, she could not really live out because she had so little education. Despite that, she had learned, been able to teach herself to read and write in two languages. Um, so one of the things that I learned a great deal from was that I was brought up in a household with my mother 
and with another woman, Maria Garcia, who was from that Garcia family. Um, and consequently, one of, one of the things my mother wound up doing was really being a housekeeper, a maid. Um, she would babysit, she would do cooking at restaurants, that kind of thing. And my guardian, Maria Garcia, worked for the Carmelite priest at Little Flower Church in San Antonio. That's where I went to school for 12 years. Um, and it is there, I think, initially, that uh, the formation of some of my values began uh, because we were subjected to the gospel six out of seven days out of the week. So I had to learn something, whether I wanted to or not. After Little Flower, I wound up going to Our Lady of the Lake for another five years. Uh, and so Catholic College, once again, was a big influence. But there, for me, was a real turn in my life. And that was that I found a mentor, Dr. Margaret Kramer. And for those of you that are professors, you understand this well. She was a big influence on me. And one of the things she did was to introduce me to all of the political leaders in San Antonio, and especially to the Mexican-American ones. There were exactly four. So when I graduate uh, at, in 1965, the college going rate for Chicanos is 4%. The people that are uh, elected officials are four in, in San Antonio. Um, and so you can see how limited uh, we are in terms of representation. And what became apparent then was that if you didn't have representation of Chicanos, you did not have any interest in our specific problems. So what happens is that um, you have people making laws, making policy that really do not reflect your needs. Uh, and that was very um, clear because during the time that I was that I first got active with the Democratic Party, the party was controlled by um, conservative Democrats. And it was the conservative Democrats that were creating the kinds of problems that we see today in terms of voter suppression and in terms of gerrymandering. So while Democrats, conservative Democrats wanted and needed our votes, they really did not have any kind of interest in making sure that we were represented and that our own people were doing their representation. That was easy to see. Uh, and it was easy to see that by all measures of the quality of life in our barrios, uh, because I came from the West Side, things were very different from the North side of town in particular. I saw this in going to work with my mother. Um, and I often talk about, for me, walking into a food pantry in a house in Alamo Heights was mind blowing because there was literally an entire room devoted to food. And that to me was, you know, um, there were times when we were saying a rosary to hope that we had money for food at home. Uh, so to me, that was very mind blowing that you could, that could happen. So when I get involved, I just told you about the, the college going rate, but we had an 80% dropout rate. We had a legislature, legislatures that were predominantly rural and white and conservative. Consequently, um, the joke in Texas was that there were better laws for cattle and sheep than there were for the people of Texas. Uh, and so, you know, in, in watching this, what I had hoped to do and what a lot of us had hoped to do was to try to change the makeup of the representation. Um, and I became convinced very early that that was the only way you could change the status and, and the life of Latinos and Chicanos in Texas. Um, so what we did at the lake was that we wanted to start a Young Democrats Club. Thought that was real simple, but the, the, the nuns said, no, the laws say that they had, the rules say, you have to have a Young Republicans Club. 
So we helped somebody, we found somebody that wanted to start a Young Republicans, help them to start our Young Republicans so we could have our Young Democrats. But that part of my life was an incredible learning experience, like it is for everyone when you first go to college. It was incredible eye-opening. Um, I, I learned so much about the way things run politically, um, but even more was to come later. One of the things that happened to me that despite the fact that, you know, I worked with a lot of political candidates that were Democrats, I lost faith in the ability of the Democratic Party to make the kind of changes we wanted made because they were not including uh, Latinos into the decision making in any way. So many of us who were young at the time uh, became interested in and the Rasunida party. Um, and I became the county chair for Rasunida in Bear County. Um, it was a real learning experience because we had to put the party on the ballot. And in order to do that, we had to get enough signatures from people who had not voted in the Democrat or Republican party. Um, we also had to run our own elections. So, you had to be very careful because you're getting money from the state and everybody's hoping you'll make mistakes so you can be put in jail um, because they hate your ass. And so we had to, to learn the Texas election code front and back. And all of that later, much later helped for me to really understand a great deal about the political system. Um, I think I'll stop there and we can talk about some of that later. Thank you so much. Yes. Now, Antonia, would you also share with us a little bit about your upbringing, your early life formation, uh, your entry into the political activism? On mute. <laughs> Um, so listening to Rosie, thank you, Rosie. That was very, very informative and instructive. Um, and Rosie and I, I think we're about uh, five years apart. Uh, she was born, uh, I was born just before uh, the end of World War II, the beginning of World War II, and she was born shortly after. So I wanna frame this a little bit in terms of um, major periods that affected me, um, some directly and some indirectly. So. <clears throat> um, the early 20th century, uh, the 1910s, of course, is the uh, era of my parents. They were born during the decade of the Mexican Revolution and World War I. And this is a moment when Tejano and uh, Mexicano populations migrate across the United States to replace Anglo workers in agriculture and urban industries during the war. So in this era, our families, Tejano families, migrated mainly uh, to the developing sectors of agribusiness uh, and industries in the Midwest. Following that 1930s and the Great Depression, which Rosie um, referenced, um, our, our parents again were formed in the crucible of social and economic upheavals and anti-Mexican politics of the Great Depression of the 1930s, when from 1929 to 1937, it is estimated that 1.8 million Mexicans were deported from the United States. Approximately 60% of those were Mexican Americans. Um, so Rosie and I lived our childhood um, in the aftermath of World War II when Anglo and African American rural populations migrated in mass to work in urban areas and the Mexican origin population became then the principal workforce in agriculture throughout the Midwest. And now another wave goes in the other, um, in another direction to the north, uh, to the Northwest, to the West and the Northwest. My family was part of that larger labor migrant labor force to the fields, hop yards and orchards of the Pacific Northwest. In 1946, we, my parents, older sister and three brothers and myself migrated to Washington State where I grew up in a labor camp in Topnish, Washington, or near Topnish, Washington, uh, working in the fields. Sometimes we worked both before and after school, depending on the crops, 
uh, and usually on weekends. Coming of age in the 1950s, 1950s, as um, we know, is an era of conformity in the period of post-war economic prosperity driven by state subsidies for agriculture slash agribusiness. The family farm really is no more. The family farm that's the icon of, of the United States. Um, at any rate, driven by state subsidies for agriculture for agribusiness, also characterized by the rise of the military industrial complex, by a political atmosphere, as Rosie noted, shaped by the political and racial oppression of people of color, by viral anti-communism, by suburbanization, and inner cities. Above all, for a Mexican-American girl coming of age, it was a period of repressing values and a restrictive social environment that stressed conformity to norms and standards set by the rising Anglo middle class. These applied to all spheres of life, to comportment, dress, language, all forms of entertainment, but especially dance. While the economic prosperity did not extend to us, the repressive social values of the larger society intersected quite well with those of my Mexican origin culture, particularly with respect to gender, sex, and, sexu and sexuality, pardon me. <clears throat> so now I want to talk a little bit about consciousness Conscientización. So I believe that children understand power relations very early, beginning with the family, which is where we first experience power relations. I became conscious of a difference, inequality, and power very early. All of us in my family worked in the fields. Todos jalábamos parejo. We all contributed to the family. We all had responsibilities for family welfare and survival, but my brother could do things I was not only because I was a girl and they were boys. I did not have the language to name it gender inequality, I, but I was act, acutely aware that this was unfair, unjust treatment. I argued about it and rebelled against this norm as soon as I could. Similarly, though I had not the language to articulate racial and class differences or how their forms of oppression were manifested, I understood it a fondo in my gut. My mother spoke little English. I was her translator in all areas of life. I both saw and felt Anglo's disdain and dislike of us when we entered a store, when we went to the doctor, when we went to church. In brief, when we entered all Anglo spaces and places. They wanted our labor, but they did not want our presence outside of the camps and fields where you could not see us, where we, could, where we were invisible. The racial hierarchies and inequalities persisted in all aspects of our lives, beginning with work. Anglos were the foremen and the irrigators, the bosses. We were the workers, stoop labor. Anglo women worked inside the sheds, sheltered from the sun and rain. Mexican women worked in the fields. If working by hourly wages, men were paid more than women of all races. Racial inequalities also included housing. We lived in um, barracks, in barrack-like structures strung together. Anglos lived in separate houses on the perimeter of the camp. <laughs> I learned on very early on that educational and religious institutions, in my experience, did not respond to our needs and were not ours. I was a good student, kind of smart and precocious, if I may say but no more than any of my friends in the labor camp who arrived in March and left in September after the harvest. My family did not continue to migrate. Uh, to migrate. Theirs followed the migrant cycle. I went to school year round. Their schooling was interrupted by the seasonal cycle of crops and work. So that my experience and my process uh, and what enables me to go to school and ultimately to get a PhD uh, but that beginning is because my father did not have a seasonal job. He worked year round in, in the labor camp, but he was a handyman. So we did not have to continue migrating. We, we worked in the fields and he had a, a year round job. Uh, so that kept the family going. Let me talk about the Chicano movement now of the, of the late 1960s and 70s. So the Chicano movement was part of a national global liberation movements. At least that was how we interact, interpreted it. The violence and weight of gender, racial, and class oppression was not alleviated when I graduated from high school in 1960 and went to college and got a teaching degree. I wanted most to not work in the fields or to be poor, and at that point in my life, not to be Mexican either. 
like all parents, mine drilled education into us and supported my going off to college. We can't stop, help you, but we won't stop you, they said. But my mom's friends, Las Comadres y Las Amigas, chastised her badly for letting me leave home and go several hundred miles away. ¿Cómo la puedes dejar ir? No sabes qué está haciendo ni con quién. My best friend's mother prohibited her from writing to me because she said I could influence her to do bad things. What did happen was that I assimilated myself into an Anglo world. I married an Anglo man, finished my education, got a teaching job, lived in suburbia, called myself Tony instead of Antonia. But I soon learned that my formal education, my profession, Anglo husband, and suburban ex existence did not protect me from the violence of racial and gender oppression. At a social gathering one Friday evening, a colleague in the Seattle High School where I taught smilingly said to me, gee, if you hadn't gone to school and gotten a degree, you probably would be a prostitute on a corner of First Street, wouldn't you? Huh? The violence of this comment shook me to my very core, and that was the basis for me of the shift and of the change. Rosie and I came of age in the 60s as the challenges to the very normative and therefore very regressive society were erupting, including the rise of the civil rights movement, liberation movements nationally and globally. Uh, I have a section on that, but won't have uh, time. Uh, what permitted me to understand and, to, that, and help me break out was the Chicano movement, and specifically the Chicano movement as it manifested itself in the farm worker, str farm worker struggle led by Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, and the struggle to improve educational and economic standing of Chicanos by challenging educational institutions, and particularly in my case, institutions of higher education, uh, to attend to our educational needs and concerns, to our history and cultural expression, and to our role and standing in these institutions. The farm worker struggle for dignity, justice, living wages, and a labor union to negotiate with management spoke directly to me. It spoke to me of working towards injust to, ju to justice, working to justice, because my experience with justice and injustice comes from that early foundation in the labor camp and the fields and the community, community um, of Tejano, Tejana farm workers. So uh, I joined the farm workers movement where I was in Seattle, Washington, teaching high school and working on an MA in Latin American studies. At that time, institutions of higher education were both largely exclusionary of Chicanos and all other non-white students. They also did not have academic courses in liberal arts or other disciplines that included our histories, cultures, social, political experience, economic experience as part of the American academic fabric. We organized Mechan in collaboration with other racial ethnic groups, challenged the institution, in this case, the University of Washington, to establish Chicano studies, ethnic studies, women's studies, and subsequently LGBT2 studies. I taught the first Chicano studies class at the U of W. The Chicano movement for me provided a venue, a space, and an organization with whom to struggle for change in all spheres of society. Though my major work and focus has been in institutions of higher education. Still, as Chicanas, we soon found that the Chicano movement was not the only and sometimes not the best answer to the work we needed to do. In brief, the movement was no less free of sexism, homophobism, and also a cultural nationalism that excluded many who wanted to contribute. We helped establish the National Association of Chicana, Chicano Studies, NAX at that time, later changed to Chicano and Chicana Studies, uh, because the standard liberal arts disciplines and professional organizations would not accept our proposals for panels or papers. They did not consider Chicano studies a full-fledged academic discipline, but generally the male membership of Knox was not interested in Chicana studies. They were not interested in issues of gender or sexuality and their intersection with race and class. They disregarded our research, scholarship, Consequently, we formed Mujeres Activas en Letras y Cambio Social, MOCs for Chicana, Latina, and Indigenous Women, and greater uh, and gender nonconforming academic students and activists. The last uh, comment on, on that on that era is that uh, uh, as Chicanas, we were struggling with our Chicano brothers in terms of gender and sexuality, and with our feminist compañeras, our feminist white compañeras. We were struggling around the issue of race and class. 
uh, precisely because they, uh, when they thought of race, thought only of the binary of white and black. And so let me leave it there and um, uh, we'll take questions. Muchas gracias, Antonia. So as we um, sift through both of your experiences, your life formations, your setting forth um, what shaped you and how it shaped the actions that you take later on. What, both of you mentioned being involved, uh, Rosie with Razumida, Antonia with Chicano Movement, Mecha and some uh, Knox and some other organizations. So what would you say are some strategies or some movidas that you picked up from doing that kind of work to dismantle these structures uh, and systems of inequality and the oppression that was there. Are there any kind of concrete um, tools that we can come away with? And I'll, I'll ask Rosie to answer first. Sure, I think there was a great deal um, to learn because one of the things about the movement was that no matter what you looked at in terms of the quality of life, we were so far behind. Uh, in, in San Antonio, the hunger that existed was even shown at a national level where they showed areas, for example, like Alasan, near Alasan Apache, where our kids were literally dying of malnutrition. Um, so many other areas of any of you that are older remember the flooding, the incredible flooding in the west, east, and south side because San Antonio's on a slope and the water would come from the north side to the west side. Um, there was a year that there were so many drownings in Edgewood that um, you know, we realized something had to be done. And like I said, it wasn't being done. So it becomes an incredible time to create alternatives. And Antonia talked about some of that because it's kind of like uh, necessity is the mother of invention. You can't sit there and say, oh, woe is me, this is a problem, and not do anything about it. If you're going to sit there and wait for somebody else to do it for you, it ain't going to happen. It hasn't happened this long, it's not going to happen. So I think that time was so full of creations of alternatives. The legal system was not helping Latinos in any way whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the 1970s were a time where we had to look at law enforcement that included the Texas Rangers, the sheriff's departments, the local police, and, and really do something to stop the kind of racist goings on that were happening at that time. Our folks were thrown in jail. Some people would be jailed for a marijuana stick, you know, one, one cigarette. Um, there was an African-American in Houston that was jailed for 20 years. Um, the beatings by the Texas Rangers in 1968, when the, the far, farm workers in the valley decide that they want to go to Austin to try to get just a little bit more money to be able to support their families, the Texas Rangers come in and beat the shit out of everybody. In 1968, at Our Lady of the Lake, when I was a student there, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights hosts the first conference on Mexican-Americans. One of the people invited to speak before them was Captain Ali of the Texas Rangers. This guy was such a jerk. If you would have heard how he spoke about our people, you would have wanted to wring his neck right then and there. Um, and those were the kinds of things we were up against. So we needed someone to protect us. And we knew that the existing structures did not protect us. So Maldiv was born. Uh, people, especially San Antonio, played a, a, a real pivotal role because many of the people that started Maldiv were in San Antonio. Same thing with Willie and, and voting rights. Southwest Voter started again in San Antonio. Um, other alternatives that were created, for example, were Las Hermanas for uh, laity and religious women who were challenging the, the church. You know, the church played a role in the times that we're young, 
where um, if you were married and you went to a priest to confession and said, my husband beats me, I need to leave him, they would tell you, no, you shouldn't do that because he's your husband. You can't do that. So none of these structures were helping. And so people like Las Hermanas and Padres who also wanted to see um, the mass in Spanish, who wanted to bring in cultural and language differences that the, many of the priests and bishops did not agree with, those were formed. For us, politically, besides dressing it up, a precursor to that had been the Committee for Barrio Betterment. In 1971, a group of us, four of us, ran for city council. We're running at large, pretty much knowing we cannot win. But there had been for many years a good government lead that had monopolized all of city council, that made all the decisions on spending. And so when there was a bond to be issued uh, across San Antonio, they would always say, we're all getting a piece of this bond. By the time the bond money ran out, the north side had been built out, their infrastructure, we had not. So we needed to create <coughs> excuse me, political alternatives. And as we ran for council, um, like I said, we didn't win. But the next time, more Latinos started running. And finally, we had some that made it onto city council that were not members of the Good Government League. So we were able to break the Good Government League's dominance. And uh, if you'll remember, <coughs> the city of San Antonio had not had a mayor who was Latino, Mexican-American, since the beginning, since the inception of the city of San Antonio. That doesn't happen until 1981 with Henry Cisneros. And then it doesn't happen again for another 20 years with Ed Garza. And then it takes another five years with my son, Julian. But the creation of all these different types of alternatives, Avance, of the Mexican American Cultural Center, all of these things looking at different aspects of our lives had to spring up because part of the movement was about self-determination, was not about waiting for somebody to call you Hispanic or call you whatever. It was about what you called yourself. And it's interesting to see that happening today. Um, but I think one of the things politically, we learned a great deal about the structures of politics, how politics is played, what you need to do to be candidates to run. But we also learned because of the incredible police brutality and because of the incredible laws that needed to be changed. For example, when I started at Our Lady of the Lake, I was 18. I couldn't vote then. You couldn't vote if you were until you were 21. Now, this is the time of Vietnam. And all our kids are going off to war. They can't even vote. So all of these things that, that we couldn't change by, because we didn't have the representation, we needed to change through legal methods. And so when you look at the civil rights movement for Latinos, a lot, and generally, a lot of the changes that were made were made through litigation. We won cases that Everything from the Garcia case, which was about how many hours they could make you work and had to pay you for, uh, to the right to vote at 18. Um, single member districts came about in 1977. Henry gets elected mayor in 1981. That made a difference because suddenly we went from a council that was almost all Anglo to a council that was six, six people in that council in 77 are minorities, just like we have today. I think we have more now. Um, but the point was that we learned a great deal about self-sufficiency, uh, about not waiting around for anyone else to do what you needed to do. 
which was to go in there, think creatively, create the alternative, and then uh, do the best that you could to make sure that those things work. They didn't always work. Rasunida didn't last. There were some things that lasted, some things that did not. But there was great learning from everything. Sometimes people say, well, what was the impact of Rasunida? Uh, many people have said, oh, tch, there was nothing. There was a whole lot. Uh, for one thing, right after Rasunida, right before the ending, you found that the Democratic Party that had not had Mexican Americans on their executive boards, nationally or statewide, suddenly find Latinos that they can put on their boards. Um, you find that, I remember being in a bar one time and this guy who was the head of SER, which you don't hear too much about today, but then it was a big thing. Um, he came to me and he said, hey, thank y'all, Rasunia. Uh, we just got a million dollars from Governor Briscoe because of y'all. And it did. It forced the Democratic Party to say, oh, shit, we have to give these people something. And so their way of doing something was to fund those groups that were not as radical, although I don't think we we're radical, but, you know, they called us a lot of things, militant, communist, and all that. But that the push that we made the noise that we made, the bringing it to their face that we made, um, that helped to move us a little further. We weren't the first ones to do that. There had been a Mexican American wave before us, but I think we were the, we were the, the ones that many of us throughout the, the country doing things in a different way were the first that really got people to think of things in a more holistic way. Often when you read about the Chicano movement, um, and it's still called the Chicano movement, um, when you read about it, you'll read about the four males, which were Cesar Chavez in California, but there was also Dolores Huerta. You'll read about Jorge Gonzalez in Colorado and about um, New Mexico, uh, and I'm drawing a blank on his name. Uh, and then, of course, Jose Angel in, in Texas as the founders of Chicano movement. But there were a lot of women involved. And like Antonia mentioned, I think that um, as women, we pretty much decided uh, that we needed to come into our own. In San Antonio, I was fortunate to work with Mario Compian and some of the other folks that I didn't consider had that kind of big problems with women. Uh, they were very supportive uh, and I was very much part of the leadership. So many of us were part of that leadership. And so one of the things we were able to do was to train other women. We would have our own conferences to train other women politically and on the issues and on the structures that could be created. Uh, and consequently, uh, throughout the country, we saw the success of art, of uh, theater, of newspapers that broke out all over the place, um, and people speaking up. Um, I remember being interviewed one time when my son Julian was going to speak uh, at the Democrat convention and there was an Anglo woman that was doing the interview and she said to me, well, all of these things, she said, what did y'all do? You talk about speaking here and speaking there. She said, what she couldn't grasp is that if you spoke up, you were gonna pay a price for that. If you spoke up, that was unlike what you were supposed to do as a woman. In my own family, there were people that really ridiculed me, didn't want to have anything to do with me because I was active. And many Mexicanos that said, don't rock the boat. If you just behave, one day things will be better. We didn't believe that at all. And that was a big learning, that things don't get better if you don't do something about it. Reminds me of the, if not now, when? And if not me, who? 
You just have to step up to the plate and do it. And I think that's, those are great lessons that you have brought to us a lot from your personal experience and El Movimiento and with other things. But I want to point out that the realm that you're working with is the political. It's the activist politics, the legal, and all the different sectors that have to do with changing policies, making change at that level. Uh, and I'm going to ask Dr. Antonia Castañeda now to tell us a little bit about how she sees the change and the lessons learned from the Movimiento in another arena. In her case, mostly in education, uh, but maybe not. I don't know. Antonia, could you take <laughs> yes, it thank over? You. And thank you, Rosie. Um, so as, listening to, as I was listening to Rosie, I think that again of the uh, comparisons, the comparative um, similarities and differences. So um, Rosie is in urban San Antonio, uh, which certainly has its rural dimensions to it, but by and large, it's an urban, it's a major urban city. Uh, we in Washington state are in rural, um, in, in rural Washington. Uh, until the night, actually until the 1970s, when we start recruiting uh, Chicano students throughout um, the state of Washington, I led a, uh, a recruitment team of five students and myself, and we went to every dance hall, every church, every field, every um, community center that we could locate to, to recruit students. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm mis losing my point here. The point is that the differences in terms of rural and urban, um, and we were all farm workers. And for the most part, people were migrant farm workers. So the possibility of developing congregations was very, very difficult. Um, and, and the oppression of uh, agribusiness, like in California, like in Texas, like everywhere, was really, really uh, heavy and powerful. So the uh, agribusiness had uh, all of the politicians, uh, uh, they were the major economy. So it was very difficult really to do a lot in terms of organizing, but nevertheless, still there were people, Lupe Gamboa, who became an attorney uh, and other folks um, who developed the, um, the, the farm workers at the UFW in the state of Washington that led strikes and so on. And we in the university then, as I said, organized with Mecha. Uh, we organized a med chat and um, the, the team that I led uh, in 1970 recruited 90 Chicano students, Chicana and Chicano students. And that was a core and still is 50 years later almost, uh, a core of, they become the professional class in the state of Washington. Uh, we didn't have any lawyers, we didn't have any very few doctors, certainly not in the Yakima Valley. There were one or two in Seattle. Uh, but it was on the basis of organizing a student group as well as organizing with other groups. Um, so we organized and were part um, related to and engaged with the African American uh, civil rights movement, with Native Americans, with Asian Americans, with women when we could, um, with any of the other groups that we could to work on the issues that we all faced. Uh, Native, I mean, African Americans were largely rural. Uh, Native Americans were both rural and urban. The, um, the, the tribal groups, the reservations were rural. Um, but the other dimension of this is that we organized on the basis of, um, we organized on the basis of a lot that we brought from our homes in terms of collectivity, in terms of reciprocity, in terms of, of, um, of, of working with and looking after um, other groups and other people. So those strategies that we brought from home and the compassion and the caring and the um, decency, we transferred that to wherever we were and whatever we were working in and whatever we were working on. And so we challenged the educational institutions based on all of those dimensions that we brought as part of our own familial background 
but also in terms of uh, our work in the fields. I mean, so if you're working in the fields, you also need to be cooperative and you need to be caring and you need to look out for other people. Um, if you're living in the camps and nobody has much, you have to, you share what you have so that everybody can have as good a uh, life or as good as food, as good a meal as possible. You take care of each other's children. And, and the thing of it is, again, in the field, so um, women who were pregnant were working in the fields. They were working in the fields uh, after they delivered. Oftentimes they uh, had no place to leave their children, so they brought them with them. Uh, so people looked out after those children and shared responsibilities. So it was, as Rosie notes, about shared responsibility, drawing on what you have to build, to build upon, to build strength and to build an organization, to build a union, to build um, mecha, to join with other groups, cross nationally, cross culturally, uh, be part of international movements. So it's all of those dimensions then. And it took longer than it did in San Antonio and Texas uh, because Texas is home. There is a historical population and a historical place here. There wasn't for us in uh, the Pacific Northwest. It has changed dramatically now. There are towns that are all Latino. Uh, certainly a lot of immigration from Mexico and Central America. So 50 years later, there's some vast changes. Um, but at the time, it was drawing on the strengths and the knowledge and the base that we had from where we came from to, to build it and, and to challenge institutions. Yeah, we have a question that kind of is going there, except it's bringing it to today. So uh, somebody wants to know if there are parallels um, or contrasts that you can see between the Black Lives Matter movement and the Chicano movement. Uh, and another kind of um, question allied to that, what can, um, can the Latinx community relate to Black Lives Matter? Rosie, you want to take that? If you want to start, go ahead and then. Okay, so that's a two-pronged question. The first is? If, yeah. if there's uh, parallels or contrast that you can see between the Chicano movement and the Black Lives Matters movement. Okay, yes, indeed. There's a lot of parallels and there are some contrasts. Uh, so in both cases, um, the, the Black Lives Movement and the Chicano movement had a lot of dimensions, but it was in, in many respects youth led. So it was a movement of young people, uh, uh, students and workers, um, um, folks in the military who become anti-war. So certainly it was a movement of young people, which Black Lives Matter is too. Not that there aren't other people, certainly there are, but the impetus came from the young. Uh, in both cases, and as Rosie mentioned, uh, she was told, her, her generation and her folks, including her, was told, uh, slow down, don't go so fast, portate bien, no hagas ruido, uh, things like that. So, and so those were, uh, th we were also told that, uh, as I'm sure the young people now, perhaps their parents are saying, I don't do that. And we see also um, the, the question, this wasn't part of the question, but I'm going to include it. If we look at other movements now, also so in Korea uh, and other locations, the movements are um, youth-led or at least youth-generated. The energy, the force, the power, the passion uh, is, is drawn from youth. So that's one parallel. Another parallel is that at the time, um, Rosie has mentioned the quote-unquote four leaders. Well, at the time there were uh, individual leaders identified with different aspects of the movement. Um, and this is a contrast because that was a case in the Chicano and African American movement. Um, but currently in the Black Lives Matter movement, that's not the case. Uh, the Black Lives Matter as a contrast is um, very um, dispersed. There isn't any one or two or four or five leaders. Um, and so they are organizing in a different way and from my perspective, in a much more productive and um, important, uh, powerful way that 
will be, I believe, long lasting. Um, and there was another part of the question. Yes, how can Latinx uh, relate or do they to the Black Lives Matter? Uh, I believe that they do. Um, but I also think that at this point, for young, for, for, for young Latinx folks who are leading uh, organizations and efforts, uh, a lot of the focus and major issue is immigration. And uh, so for the Black Lives Matter, that is not a principal issue, uh, but it is of necessity for Latinx uh, folks and organizations. And so if we look at uh, the immigrant, um, the, the organizations that focus on immigration, uh, it is, it's young folks. Um, um, so Dreamers, Mi Gente, I mean, any number of organizations and their focus is largely immigration. That doesn't mean that there aren't other issues that they are deeply concerned with, including um, uh, healthcare, including um, uh, the economic dimensions of life and, and, uh, and, and education and other issues, but um, much is right now driven by immigration. And especially since, um, we see what the Trump administration has done in terms of incarceration, separation of, of children from families and the horrific uh, terror inspiring conditions that, that uh, this administration is holding um, people and refusing refugee, refusing asylum. Um, so anyway, those are some. I would say, I would say that, you know, one of the things that's really has made me so very happy is to watch the Black Lives Matter leadership, which is organic. I mean, it has just risen up because it is the time to do it. Um, they haven't gone to leadership classes necessarily or done the formal things, but they're there to speak out with a great deal of passion. What I have enjoyed is seeing that the Black Lives Movement has made room for Latinos, for anybody, Native Americans, uh, for anyone to join. What we saw in San Antonio were, you know, lots of us marching with the Black Lives Movement folks. Um, and I think one of the things, though, that, that we can look at in terms of law enforcement is the way law enforcement, specifically ICE and uh, the Border Patrol have treated not only immigrants uh, of all kinds, but also people who are uh, citizens. And so, you know, that, that law enforcement thing is an aspect of Black Lives Matter. I think that what Black Lives Matter is saying is that we have to change the way we look at law enforcement. Uh, and so it's going to be what I see is that, you know, things won't happen overnight. They don't change quickly from one day to the next or one year to the next. I think Black Lives Matter is so very important in raising the issues in pointing to what needs to be done. Um, but it's going to take a sustained effort by all of us who care for a very long time before this country makes those changes. Because that's a very entrenched culture. Um, it's a very, and you can see right now, if you look at the ads of, that are against some of the Democratic candidates, you'll see them all saying the same thing. I stand for the police. I'm with the police. Well, I'm not against the police. You know, who's against the police? They're, what you're against is a culture that is often corrupt, that is prejudiced, that is, uh, doesn't even mind the law that they're supposed to be enforcing. So, I mean, I think that um, if we look at how we play a role in that, I think it's a really good vehicle for bringing all kinds of people together uh, 
and it's probably one of the best vehicles that we have right now. The immigration thing has got to continue. And when dreamers and younger people started many of those marches years ago, again, I was very happy to see that because the silence that we let go on for too long just makes things worse. It isn't until you have people willing to stand up that you begin to, to plant the seeds of change because it doesn't happen right away. I'm glad you're mentioning that, uh, the fact that it doesn't happen overnight, that it takes time, and that these movements, although the Black Lives Matter may not have an identifiable leadership now because it's so dispersed, the, at the beginning, and I think on the chat, somebody, uh, Graciela was saying, yes. it, it continues today and was a queer Black women's leadership, the, the ones that first actually named it, yeah. although there were expressions, obviously, of dissatisfaction that were going on. So that's there. Um, I think we've touched on a couple of things that I, are now conflating into some of the questions that I had. Uh, for example, we wanted to, and somebody else actually put it on there uh, about the, uh, the, the past and then the future. But uh, before we go there, I also wanted to complicate things a little more because it is a very complex issue. We have the Afro-Latino community just as enmeshed. Um, and so there's kind of this Nepantla space, this uh, hybridity that happens with the groups that are not now as easily identifiable as one or another. So it is more complex. The composition of the protest groups, of the groups that are against the injustice that we see both in immigration and with the police uh, situation, we have these groups coming together that are not just one or another. It's really complex. And like Rosie was pointing out, the uh, protests here in San Antonio, it was pretty mixed. Uh, although I do have to agree with Antonia that the youth leadership, the youth uh, at all times, I think, back in the 60s and now, and not just here, she pointed out Korea, same thing in China. So that you have these, uh, Argentina, you have these groups that are almost spontaneously combustible, they come out, but it's not. It's something that has been building up and developing over time, just like change will take that long to get there. Uh, the uh, question that was I saw here about the past and the future, where you see, uh, let's see, where was it? Um, yeah, how do you see the connections between now and the past then? What's different? What's the same? What's new? It's the same old issues, a lot of them, <laughs> fortunately. Um, you know, some things have gotten better. When I look at politically representation, starting from just four to so many more that we have, that's great. But that still has left out women for, for the most part, and we're still trying to catch up in that. Um, when I look, I think one of the main things that I've always seen in the differences is that today's today's battles and today's people have a lot more resources than we had in the 70s. There's an internet, there's this phone, there's a fax, there's a connection to the world. We didn't have that. We had little newspapers and people, you know, try to put together in their kitchen. Um, you, you Mimeograph. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yes, yes. I mean, that's a good example. Um, and, you know, made copies with those stupid blue papers in between and stuff. <laughs> so the technology gives you an incredible edge over what we have. Um, and I think also that, you know, people have learned from what happened before to some extent and they don't make some of the same mistakes that we might have made. Um, when, when the last four years for me have been, you know, I'm 73, so I've been through Nixon and I've been through Reagan. And I thought that was bad for, for so much that they did. But then when you hit four years and when you see what has happened now, I think the young folks now, you look at, you know, people talk about what's happening to this generation, the youngest generation, in terms of 
finances and having to live at home when they're already older and not being able to save and buy a house. I mean, that's going to get better. But right now it isn't better. And we, we were poor. So, you know, you could figure, oh, well, if you're always poor, you're going to always be poor. But you had some vision of what you could strive to. It's harder now. And I always feel bad when I hear people say the American dream is dead. I hope not. I mean, I hope there's a hope and a dream and people who bring open opportunities. You be the people that open opportunities. I mean, we have to go back to, to the American dream was never totally real, but you have to go back to a time when values mean something and those values become reality when real opportunity exists for everyone not just for a certain group of people, where discrimination, where you're not allowed to discriminate against anybody and where that's real. I think we're getting closer as you talked about Afro, like, you know, you know, there's a lot of mix of races now. I would hope that there's a better understanding and yet look at what you're dealing with. The proud boys, I don't know what the fuck they're proud of, those people, uh, you know, all of these, these folks that have incredible bias. Um, we dealt with that too. We had threats too, but I don't ever remember anybody plotting to kidnap governors. You know, I do remember them trying to shoot you and stuff, but send you terrible messages. But this is a time it's also a time more, I think. I don't know if Antonia, Antonia will agree with this, or you would, Norma, but there's more a proliferation of guns, okay? We knew guns were around. I knew they were around. But nobody I was around had guns when I was active in Rasamiga and active in the movement. Today, everybody and their mother seems to have guns. Um, that's scary because there's not any regulation. I don't care if you have a gun. I mean, if, as long as there's a regulation and you're not, you know, you don't have these things that shoot, that can shoot all sorts of bullets in one minute. Um, that is a frightening thing. So, I mean, there's similarities, there's difference, but the same thing holds true. You have to have people stand up and do what they can to try to create the kind of world they want. And as long as we have that, then we have a chance that this country will grow closer to the ideals that it espouses. Antonia, do you want to respond? You're muted. Yeah. Okay, I keep forgetting. Um, so I, I'll, I want to, I think, a little bit respond to the question. Um, and and I, I, I agree that we disagreed, Rosie. I don't want anybody to have guns, period. I just let us outlaw guns totally. Uh, but in relation to, um, to then and now, I think, of course, that, and, and Rosie's 73, I'm 78. So, ya estamos en mediodía para abajo, as my mother used to say. Um, so every gen I believe that every generation has its struggles uh, and that every generation finds, locates, works, and develops strategies to address the issue of their, of their particular generation or generations. Now, that, that means that we as elder folks or older folks absolutely have to support in every way we can with our bodies, with our money, with anything that we have at our disposal. Um, so having said that, I have great hope because of what the, this current generation is doing, uh, how they're working and what they're working on, and how they're doing it uh, more broadly and more collectively. Um, I, I do want to respond to a question that I saw on, um, on chat or a comment, and that was um, um, Rusty Barcelo's comment. Uh, about um, something that connects us all uh, across race and race, particularly the Black Lives Matter and Latinx um, communities, 
uh, is the issue of violence. And because that violence is directed at all of us um, and, and will continue to be, uh, unfortunately, regrettably. Uh, and so we have to keep pushing to ameliorate, to end that violence as much as possible uh, with police reform. Uh, and uh, Graciela notes that, um, that this past summer, hundreds of young people went to city council for the first time and so political action and challenged the police, the police, but council didn't cut police and he actually gave them an extra 8 million. So that means that uh, then we have to up our strategy and keep, 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 keep at it. We do not stop. And even though we don't always, we aren't always successful, we, we can keep uh, struggling and fighting and we, and we must. Um, so I am very hopeful when, because of illness and COVID, I did not march this, uh, uh, this summer. Uh, but uh, I was deeply moved, and and uh, and and once the COVID is over, I will be marching again. Um, let me see what there was. Something. Well, we've gone over time, <laughs> but I just kind of maybe ask that you answer a couple of more, and then quickly. One question asks: Do you think we need, or should we have, another civil rights leader like Reyes Lopez Tijerina? And uh, so just very quickly, yes or no, and maybe why, <laughs> Antonia? No, uh, I, I, Reyes for, had, had some very intelligent and good work, uh, but basically he was also totally masculine, masculinist um, and, and problematic in that regard. So I don't want any leader like that ever. Okay. <laughs> Estás muted, Rosie. If you can separate Reyes from the cause, <laughs> I would say that the cause in terms of the land struggle continues today. Um, you know, there was a period where so much of our land was lost throughout the Southwest. Um, the breaking of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, all of that. So do I want someone just like Reyes? And he's the one I forgot. Um, <laughs> not exactly, but I do want to maintain the struggle about yeah. getting back some of that land. Um, I think we need to, to continue that. And I'm going to go ahead and, and kind of close by saying that many of the issues that we have discussed here are ongoing. They haven't stopped. We still have things happening today, like the violence, like um, racial profiling, many things that were faced in the movimiento are still with us. And so that should tell us we should stay vigilant, stay active, stay with the cause, stay struggling to correct that. And like Rosie said, to make it a, a world, a better world for all of us, the world we all want to see. And uh, I just love the discussion. We could go on for another hour. Thank you all for joining us. and particularly Rosie and Antonia, thank you for agreeing to participate in this discussion. And I see people thanking you and uh, dándote las gracias. And, oh, wow, we have El Tigre's daughter. I remember Tigre, I, yes, one of my friends. Uh, so let's continue the discussion. If you want to, um, I don't know, Dania, We've gone over almost 15 minutes now, so, but it's really rich and I'm very happy. And there have been questions about whether the recording is going to be made available. Can you come back and tell us a little more? Yes, the, the recording will be, would be available. Uh, if you can uh, either email us at any time, we'll be able to open it. And we are also working on a YouTube uh, channel, so it will be available on YouTube too. And follow Moss. It was on there somewhere on the on the chat. Yes, I will I will post it. Around. It's the Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, like Dania said at the beginning, don't forget to vote. Uh, early voting has already started here in Texas, and wherever you are, that's kind of the message we've been sending out all month. So don't forget to vote and tell everyone you know to go out and vote. Any closing remarks, Rosie or Antonia? Uh, no, just to thank you, Norma and Mas and Dania and all the folks who worked on this. Uh, I was able to attend 
uh, the other sessions, the other um, gatherings that you had, Zooms, and they were very important and very instructive. And so thank you and Mas for, for all of this work and let us continue. I have enjoyed this very much, Rosie. Uh, this yeah. is the time we've able, been able to do this together. <laughs> let us do it again soon. Thank you, everybody, and thank you to the audience for attending. Thank you. Yes, thank you, audience, for being there and uh, to all of you who put it together. Uh, MAS is one of those alternatives that we're so happy to see now. Um, so thank you very much for all that you're doing. Muchas gracias y buenas noches. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That was great. Gracias a ti. Thank you. Thank you. Antonia, thank you so much for everything. You're very welcome. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Saludos a Arturo. Oh, hello, Katsu. ¿Cómo estás? Yes. I think Arturo was on. I don't know if he's still yeah, on. Yeah, I saw him. He, I, he signed off already. Maybe oh, he'll come through okay. the door behind you. <laughs> he was trying to adjust the light, but he said you got too much. But anyway. <laughs>